for those listening who do not know, Nichelle is the first black woman to ever host Entertainment Tonight, which um, I know, like, that's it just it's I mean, it's cool anyway. It's a cool job regardless. But I grew up on the farm, the, Jamel. This that's why. Oh, you know, we're going to talk about wild. the pig farm. We're going to talk about the pig farm. So you've gone through this journey at Entertainment Tonight. I mean, you've been a correspondent, weekend yeah. anchor, weekday anchor. Like, you, you've done every possible job there, yeah. but the job... So as you were going through that, um, it seemed like you were very concerned you were never going to get the job that you're in now. So mm-hmm. how were you able to reconcile that? And yet still you're coming to work every day. You're you're being your excellent self. Like, what was that journey really like for you as you're trying to make your way to this position? Well, if I'm being completely honest, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn about it because I have talked about it before. So, And I want to be clear the bosses and the regime that I have now is not the people that I started this journey here with. And they do look at me and value me in a completely different way um, than I was. Um, And so, and I'm also not um, trying to come at anybody that was here before me that didn't see me in that light. It's their right not to see me in that light. I, just always knew there were other reasons, but well, I felt like there were other reasons behind the reasons that they didn't see me that way because, you know, and it's not to make myself have a big head or think any way. Cause I always think people should think this way about themselves, but I put myself up against anybody any day. Um, and so I would always be like, okay, there has to be something else to this. Um, but it was, it wasn't easy for me here. I mean, there was a while when I first came here that I, I had, um, people that I worked with bosses that I worked with that I had a really tough time with. I came from CNN and, um, at CNN, I had really found a nice lane for myself. Um, I, I really had found my voice over there in a lot of ways I felt like, and, um, I thought that, you know, under Jeff Zucker, my, my, my efforts were always valued and appreciated. And I really appreciated that. And when I came here, I was, you know, I, I, I was told I was coming here because I had number one, that experience and that point of view. And when I got here, what I, um, what I found was that my point of view, my voice, all those things were looked at as, um, in a lot of ways, angry black woman, um, the be that, if I had a point of view or if I had an idea or a suggestion, it was looked at as being combative or looked at as being this. And so I had never experienced that before. And so that was really tough. Like my friends at CNN used to joke with me and say, you are sunshine Susie. When did you become sister soldier? I'm like, I know, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) But, um, but like yeah, that, that was like something that I really battled for a, a couple of years until, um, you know, that regime wasn't here anymore. Um, and thankfully that happened because if that didn't happen, I probably wouldn't be here because there were a lot of times. Um, and thankfully I have a partner in Kevin Frazier and someone that was here with me during those times that, you know, looks like me and has an experience that is like mine that I could go to. And in those moments when I wanted to scream out loud, I could go in his office and scream and be understood. And, you know, and I had a safe place Um, because a lot of people, a lot of us in the corporate world and a lot of us in in the industry don't, because a lot of times we are the only in a place. And so I'm really thankful of that because there were a lot of times when I just went to him and said, I don't know what's happening here. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know. And he would talk me off the ledge a lot of times. Um, Because, you know, you talk about workplace microaggressions and all that, all of that was happening. And then we had, um, you know, we had a regime change, a couple of them, but in this latest iteration, you know, we had um, a boss that came in, Aaron Johnson, and she just has a different outlook. She really has an appreciation for who I am and what I do and what I bring to the table. And although it didn't happen right when she got here, I did feel a different way. And I also took some onus on myself because I was in such a position where I felt like I had to battle every day. um, I insulated myself. So while I was battling my bosses, I felt like I also wasn't making uh, relationships with people here. So it was like I was in this battle and I was inside myself, 
but nobody else really got to know me or knew who I was. So the only thing they ever had to go on was what the bosses, they would hear from those mouths. And so that I realized too, at a time, like, you know what, come up out of yourself. Don't be so angry and, and bitter and upset because I had valid reasons for feeling that way, but don't be that way so much that you don't show people who you really are. So I started making um, relationships here just on my own with people and, and things changed there. People started getting to know me, who I am. They understood me a little bit more, how I move, how I am, that I'm a direct person. If I have a problem with somebody, I'm going to come to you. Let's work this out. It, you know, and, and they really actually, I think now so many of my colleagues appreciate that and appreciate me. And I have amazing relationships with people here that I work with and all of those things, you know, it, 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 it was a process, but I, I'm glad that I went through that. I mean, you know, now I do have a lot of um, my um, coworkers and colleagues and bosses who say to me, we are sorry we were late to the party. We're here now, but we realize we were late to the party and we are sorry that we were. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a lesson of me too, that, that everything, what will be for you will be for you. And, and what happens is going to happen in the time it's supposed to happen because to now I'm 48 years old. And like, I do feel like I'm really in the, the heart and the thick of what I'm doing and it's getting better as I get older, which for a woman in this industry and a woman of color in this industry, that's wild. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. And I'm, I'm glad you shared that because yeah. You I know, hope that I made sense because sometimes I no that talking. made and <laughs> no that made total sense. And the thing is, your story is so relatable to so many mm -hmm. people, especially mm -hmm. to Black women in our industry. Absolutely. And I know you get this, especially as you know, one of the the stars of our profession. That so many young women come up to you, I know, and ask you, how do you survive in those kind of environments? Because inevitably, yeah. it's going to happen at some point in your career that you're going to get to a place where they may not see you. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot. In fact, a lot of places we will be like that. I went through that period at ESPN, went through it for yeah. a good five or six years. And it's like it's during that time that you have to figure out a way to climb up out of, as you said, like yourself, your feelings and all of that. When you know the reason you're maybe not getting the opportunities that you yeah. should yeah. and how it doesn't turn you bitter or against your coworkers and you got to still keep performing at a high level. And that's not to say you don't advocate for yourself. But that is the question that I wanted to ask out of that is that when when young women, especially young women of color, mm -hmm. come up to you and ask you about how you survive these particular battles, a question I get asked a lot is, you know, how do you know what battles to pick? So mm. within this framework of everything happened to you at, at ET before you got to this position, that's not to say that you will not have more battles to pick. Yeah, uh, oh, we have you, them every day. I have them every day. Yeah, <laughs> but how did you make those decisions about, you know, as you were experiencing these microaggressions and mm -hmm. macroaggressions, like how did you decide, like, this one is the one I'm going to go to the mat for? Well, um, for a while, every I didn't pick battles. Everything was a battle, and that that wasn't the most productive way to go. And not to say you have to kowtow to anybody or whatnot, but um, there are certain things. You know, every day I felt like well, it's this and this and this and this and this. Um, and so I, I really just tried. Like I, I tell this story too. I had I had a situation for the longest time to where there were people here in our in our um, hair and makeup department that did not know how to work with ethnic hair. And when I came in, not that they were bad people, nice people, but they had no idea how to work with ethnic hair. And I would bring it up, I'd mention it. And, you know, instead of seeing like she, you know, everybody else here has someone who knows how to do their hair and make them look beautiful. And she doesn't, they saw it as me asking for something special, not me asking for equal treatment, right? And so that became like a part of, oh, she's a diva. She doesn't want us to judge. No, I just want someone here who knows. I want someone here who knows how to do everyone. That should be the case. It shouldn't be, you know, they know how to do everyone but Nichelle. And it would be like, well, you don't want us to touch you. No, I walk in here and I see people with products that I know don't 
work with my hair. So I know what's going on and it shouldn't be my Mm -hmm. job to tell people how to do my hair, you know? And so that was like an ongoing battle for years. And it got to the point where I finally said, okay, I'm going to wear natural and they, you know, I'm not going to have that battle because then I can do it my own, which I shouldn't have to do that either. But those are kind of the ways after it felt like sometimes I would be defeated and just say, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. And now that's been rectified. My personal stylist is also the show stylist now, and she's been doing my hair for 20 something years. And that came from also starting to have more of a voice and a new regime that realized, you know what, we are being, this isn't cool. Like she, this is who that she's asking for equal treatment. But um, it, it just became where, again, going to Kevin a lot of times and him being like, and we do this with each other too, um, him being like, you know what, take this one. You know what, it, it, do this one. But you also do feel in your gut when you know you have to say something. I mean, we just had a situation the other day um, here where we were doing a story with an artist who had had some um, a history of, of some racial um, issues and he has been working to redeem himself. Um, but I, Kevin and I both felt a little weird about it. And that was a, a point, that was one of the situations where I felt like I needed to go talk to my boss about it and say, okay, what does this look like? What are we doing? You know, and we had a really productive conversation and not that when you do fight a battle, you're not always going to win every one of them, but it's just about knowing within yourself that you've done your best and you've had a voice and you're on record saying what you need to say. Um, And now I think that I do have a good, a good handle on that. Um, And it's, and, 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 you know, it's not every day that I have to do that anymore. That to me was, was a situation where I felt like, okay, um, I know who I am as a person. I also know who I want, how I want to present myself to um, our viewers. And so this is something I really need to talk, talk to her about. And she understood. Um, Listen, I I hear you because like if I go into any, you know, sort of uh, makeup tent or makeup um, you know, some of the, uh, almost look like mobile homes, any makeup yeah. room, whatever it is. I don't see no edge gel in there. I'll be like, hot uh, comb. I don't see nothing. Okay, like I'm, I got braids, but I was like, I need to see some edge gel. Right. And I need, like, I need exactly. To see and so if those products aren't there, you already know. 